Let's uh, come in our time to the Lord in prayer. Almighty Father, we thank you for this time this morning that we can come to worship, to sing your praises. Lord, it is a day that we celebrate the fact we can meet face to face together. So Lord, through this time, we ask that you might be with each one of us, that we might enjoy the company of others, the fellowship we share around Jesus Christ, one with the other. And in turn, Lord, that it, when we leave later today, we might know it has been a good time because we've been in the presence of others in the midst of the fellowship with Jesus Christ at the centre. So we pray this and ask this in his precious name. Amen. It's good to be together on a morning like this. It's a time where we can celebrate and sing and, and just focus ourselves on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you if you're going to stand with me as we sing together. Meekness and majesty, manhood and Bible reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 50, and you'll find it on page 222 in the New Testament section of the Church Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have a few notices. Wednesday evening and then Thursday morning is our Bible study on fellowship of Christ's body. Will you bow with me as we pray? Almighty Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have. Your word is clear when it tells us that we live in a relationship with you. And any relationship, Lord, is, is based on an interaction between ourselves and the other person. And Lord, we have an interaction with you as we hear your word, as we pray, as we sit and, and meditate and think about our relationship with you, as you've touched our lives. And Lord, our, our goal and our aim is to, to please you, to love you, to love you with everything that we are. But to be truthful, Lord, that doesn't always happen. Other things get in the way, our minds wander, we don't do those things that we need to in obedience to you. And Lord, we pray this morning that you might forgive us. Oh Lord, our hearts are fickle, but our desires are to serve you. Lord, it's not an easy forgiveness, because it comes in the person of Jesus Christ, who gave up everything for us. His death on the cross removed our sins. And the same is true, Lord, of, of the people around us that we're in relationship with. Oh, Lord, when we do things that harm and hurt, sometimes it's without us even knowing. Other times it's, it's willfully. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Through your Son on, and his death on the cross, take our sins away. But, Lord, at the same time, there are those that we need to go and make right with. There are those that we need to deal with. Those we need to apologize to. Those we need to love. Oh Lord, give us the strength and the ability to do so. And in turn, that we might be in true fellowship with all those who call themselves followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because we are any more special or, or have any greater uh, grace than anybody else but because of the love of God that is is lavished on us in Jesus Christ that we can love others with the love of Christ so we ask this and pray this in Jesus name amen let's stand as we sing together when the music fades
Thank you. Please be seated. Sorry. Prayer is a phenomenal opportunity for us to come before the Lord. Prayer is a time when we can quieten our minds, put away the things that cloud in on us, and center our thoughts on Jesus Christ. It's a time where we can take those burdens that we are carrying and lay them at the foot of our Savior. There's times we can take the burden we carry for others and put it where it belongs, in the hands of Jesus Christ. So will you bow your heads with me as we pray? There are many burdens we carry. And maybe for a moment you want to think about those whom you love, family members, friends, maybe others here in the family of St. Andrews. And the burdens they carry. We often pray for illnesses and uh, treatments and cancers and things, but sometimes there are those hurts that are being carried by others. There's confusion, there's a reticence, there's an anxiousness, even after the COVID virus or amidst the COVID virus. Let's spend a moment as we lift those people up, asking the Lord to draw near to them, strengthen their faith, open their eyes, and surround them with his love. At the same time, let's think of those who you might have prayed for now, but also have illnesses, sicknesses, those dealing with uh, chronic illnesses, treatments they're undergoing, those who are awaiting blood tests or the next cycle of tests, and just laying before the Lord the, their readings and their marks that the Lord might undertake in their lives. I want you to do something for me. I want you to put your hand up in the air. Left or right hand doesn't matter. Put your hand up in the air. I'm not going to turn you into something raving lunatic. But with your hand in there, say, Lord, this is me this morning. Crawling out to you. This is my heart's desire, my burden. Spend a moment in prayer. Just talking with your master and your saviour. We believe that God answers prayer. We believe that God is mighty and powerful. Why don't you now thank him for what you've just prayed, that, Lord, you know the answer. You, you have already started and will answer. And I praise you and thank you. As you drop your hand, we can think of our church. Think of St. Andrew's, Lord, hold us in your hand. Keep us safe. Oh, Lord, we pray that you might give us wisdom and direction, that we might move forward not on our terms or, or with our agenda, but with yours, guiding and directing us. 
Lord, we pray for those who are not with us this morning, those who might be listening to the service at this time, or those who are, are just sitting alone. O oh Lord, be with them. Let them know your presence. Let them know our love. And Lord, hasten the day when we are all together as one family again. Oh, Father, we lay these all before you, and we pray that you might draw near to each one of us, strengthen us, give us the joy of our salvation, and the joy of knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. This we pray in his wonderful name. Amen. I came across this hymn, and I'd like you to stand and sing with me. It's when he cometh, when he cometh, to make up his jewels. Let's stand as we sing. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, that passage that Barbara read for us this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, and this is the second part of the sermon on great changes of the resurrection. We've been looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, and the whole um, sermon subject was being cross-eyed Christians. Being cross-eyed Christians. That doesn't mean that we're looking squint, but that our eyes are always fixed on the cross of Jesus Christ. How we live, how we relate to others, how we act, how we respond is all about the gospel, the cross of Jesus Christ, and how that has changed us from the way we look at our leaders, the way that we respond to others in church, the way we see our, our, ourselves as, as either being um, of status or not of status, of intellect or not of intellect. And it tells us that as the church, we are together the body of Christ. That together we're, we're all here to support, encourage, build one another up. 
And then right at the end of Corinthians, Paul does something that um, really puts the cherry on the top. He says, when it comes to the end of your Christian walk, it is only the beginning of eternity. When you've come, well, that maybe sounds wrong, but when you come to your Christian walk on this earth, it is only the beginning of eternity. And we saw last week when we dealt with this, that the resurrected changes starts with a body that must die. If Every one of us will die. Every one of us will face death in some ways, unless the Lord returns first. Now for generations and generations and the last 2,000 years, I think there have been ministers standing in front of churches saying, we must die unless the Lord returns first. And the Lord hasn't come back yet. So we wait in great expectation for that day. Second, we saw that our heavenly bodies are imperishable. Means that just as this body is going to wither and die, and I spoke about the, the number of tablets we've got to take and, and how the aches and the pains get more, so it is with our body will give up the ghost one day. And then thirdly, we saw that our heavenly bodies will be heavenly. Be just like Jesus Christ. And that's the importance of where we are. We saw that last week, that when it comes to the resurrection, there's great promise. It's not something to be feared. It's something that should encourage us and draw us into a relationship or into a thinking and into a, men, um, a mental state before God, saying, I'm waiting in expectation. I want you to come back. Oh, Lord Jesus, I want to be with you. And the way that Paul puts it, it's almost like he's saying, it's better to die than to continue living. Isn't that what he said in Philippians? For me to live is Christ, so I live now for Jesus Christ. But to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Today, people say, no, no, no. It's all about living. You've got to get the most out of life. Because when you die, it's all gone. For us, death is but a stepping stone. Death is but just a doorway that we pass through. And it uses it again in this section about falling asleep. It doesn't talk about death, it talks about sleep. Why? Because it's no more traumatic than going to bed last night, switching off the light. It's no more traumatic for the Christian than that event. You look at me and you say, Tony, have you lost your marbles? No, not at all. Not at all. You see, for a Christian, if we're hanging on to the here and the now, it is a trauma to face death. I've had the privilege of being at people's deathbeds. And I'll never forget one man in this church some years ago said to me, I thank the Lord that I'm dying and I want to get it over with. <laughs> and and I, I said to him, but Charles, why? He said, because I'm waiting in great expectation. I've been in this bed now for six weeks and I haven't got out of it. But I want to dance in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't want to leave behind his family, his friends, his wife, who he loved dearly. But he saw it as a great privilege and pleasure and joy to go and dance in the presence of the Lord. Now, he's talking about dancing. We don't know what will happen in heaven apart from us being before, before the throne and presenting our crowns to the Lord Jesus Christ in glory and honor. What a great picture that is. See, our heavenly bodies will be like Christ's body in every way. Fourthly, we see then this morning, our heavenly bodies will be immortal. Our heavenly bodies will be immortal. There'll be no more death, no more trouble, no more dying, no more sickness, no more health. No more health. No, no more ill health, bad health. I mentioned this last week. Go with me, if you will, to 
the last page in your Bible. Not the one that says maps or table of weights, but Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed, passed away. And listen to this. There was no longer any sea. I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautiful and dressed for a husband. There it is. The church presented to God. The heavens in all its glory, in all its fire, in all its perfection. And verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now is the dwelling of God with men. We long for that today, don't we? We long for it. And then it will happen. Now is the dwelling of God with men. And he will live with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And their God. No longer will it be this idea of by faith we've got to trust in God and believe in and read his word. He'll be there with us, dwelling among us. And then look at verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. What's he saying here? All of those things that came about in Genesis chapter 3 because of Adam and Eve's sin is reversed in heaven. The pain, the suffering, the anguish, the sickness, the death. Genesis chapter 3, that's the curse because of the sin. Is removed because they've all passed away. The old order of things have passed away. He was seated on the throne and said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of water, the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur which is the second death. That is what heaven has been promised for us. Our bodies will be immortal. They won't end. They won't crumble and, and get sick and aches and pains. will be no more. There will be no more tears. You know the best thing about heaven? No stress. No stress. Oh, we thank the Lord for what he has got prepared for us. Let's go back then to 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 50, he says there, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, you and I will be changed. Those who trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be changed to be like him. Isn't that a glorious thing for us, a promise for us as Christians? Isn't it a promise that, that this life is not going to end with just a poof? But this life is but the stepping stone into glory. This life is but the next step in our lives. Where will you be one second after your last breath? The Bible tells us we'll be in the presence of the Lord. And if we love the Lord Jesus and have committed ourselves by faith in Him, to Him, the promise is there. 
as he welcomes us into his church. If you look with me, if you will, at uh, 1 Thessalonians. Lovely, lovely book. For 1 Thessalonians 4, we're dealing with this on a, on a Thursday morning. So if you're missing out on Bible study, come and join us Thursday morning. A little bit of a plug there for advert for the Sunday school, um, Sunday school Bible study. From chapter 4 and verse 13, he talks about when the Lord returns. And he uses the same type of language as he does in 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. He's using the same language here. It says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men that have no hope. Don't be like those who think that it's just this world and then that's nothing. Don't grieve like people who think when you die, it's just disaster. For a Christian, it's not. It's not a grieving process. It's a joy process. You know, I've been through many funerals. And as much as the heart is hurting, it is a celebration. You know, they talk now about, um, let me just, I'll get on my, my soapbox again. They talk about, you celebrate the person's life. How can you celebrate someone's life when their eternity is in hell? And one of the most difficult things I have to do is funerals for people who are not born again. You can only talk about the year and now. Because if you talk about what's going to happen there, you'll scare the congregation into running out of the church screaming. But what a great opportunity to tell them about Jesus Christ, who saved them from that. Don't grieve like men who have no... Yes, we do grieve because we lose people, and that's, that's heart sore. We grieve because the loved one you, you cherish has gone. But just for a little while, just for a little while, there is a loss and there is a, a heartache. But the joy is that it's not the end if they love and know the Lord Jesus Christ. So it says here, uh, look with me if you will, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who have died before Jesus Christ comes will rise first. Uh, after that, verse 17 we who are still alive or are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord for ever. See, we will be immortal. Not because we've achieved the status, but because the Lord Jesus Christ has conquered death on our behalf. The Lord Jesus Christ has conquered death. From 1 Thessalonians 5 onwards, 5 verse 1 onwards, talks about that. It says, we don't know the time or the date, so don't be confused and don't, don't run off to people who are saying it's going to be this time or that time, etc. Because when the Lord Jesus comes, no one will doubt that he has returned. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, every eye shall see the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me at verse 18. For verse 18, Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Look at verse 5 verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Just as in fact you are doing. When it comes to the resurrection, it's the most encouraging thing we can do to other Christians. Why? Because this world is hard. And even if we've got the easiest life in this world, there are still hardships, still illnesses, still problems, still pains. I did this on, on Sunday, on, on Thursday morning. I said, every single one of us is suffering from the effects of sin. Not so much our sin, but original sin. And I took my glass of and said, every single one in this room, and apart from one Two youngsters, they don't count. Three. 
There's only three people in this room who's not wearing glasses, but they might be wearing contact lenses. Can you imagine one day you won't have to go looking for your glasses so you can read? You won't have to try and find where your glasses are. Everything will be made new. All those things that ail us will pass. The hassles that we have in life, the problems that you have to face, maybe even having to count your pennies to make the end of the month. You won't need money in heaven because the streets are lined with gold. You can't take your money with you because all the riches you need are in heaven. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm so far away from my notes that my tablet switched off. Come on. So therefore we see that the first thing is there's great joy. The second thing I mentioned a bit earlier on is it's not death as in dying and gone. He refers to it as sleeping. He refers to it as sleeping. Look with me, if you will, there at 15. There's a myth, mystery in verse 51. I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, you see the same words used there, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. It's a sleep that he talks about. Now this is not referring to a soul sleep or an intermediate state between heaven and earth. It's talking here a a euphemism used for going to sleep as you would last night to wake up this morning to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing more traumatic traumatic than that. Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy um, chapter 4. He says, this body of mine is coming to an end. I'm facing my persecution. I'm facing my death. He says, this tent is going to be collapsed and then I will pass over and the word he uses there is the same for word for departing is the same word used when a ship leaves one harbor to go to another when an army demobs to move to another settlement that's all it's going to be for us to move from one to the other From this earth with all its issues, with all its hassles, to heaven with all its joys. Don't you want to jump for joy that that's waiting for you? Give me an amen. Amen. (laughs) I'll get you going this morning. I had your hands in there earlier. I'll get you going this morning. And then he talks about a mystery. And the mystery is we don't know. We don't know what. Whether we'll still be alive when Jesus comes or we might have fallen asleep in him. That's the mystery. Not what's going to happen afterwards, but how long is it going to take? 1 Thessalonians 5 says, it's up to God. Jesus himself said, just as you see the clouds rising and you know the next, the dawn is coming, so it will be. It'll be like the thief that comes in the night. You don't know when to expect him, but you've got to take precautions. And for each one of us, that's the mystery. Lord, it might be in my time. I was bold enough once to say, and, and I'm not a prophet, and I'm, I'm not uh, claiming to be a prophet at all in, in the sense of foretelling the future. So don't say, well, Tony says it's going to happen like this. But I've just had that feeling for a long time that as I'm watching history around me, that I might in my lifetime have the opportunity of not sleeping, but the Lord returning. And to live with that great expectation. It might not be. That's in God's hands. But it might be. And what a glorious day that will be for each one of us. What a glorious time that will be of celebration when the dead in Christ rise. To be with him forever. We will not all sleep. 
but it will all be with him forever. And then he, he does something here. He, he quotes two verses out of the Old Testament. Look with me, if you will, there at those verses. Um, uh, blah, 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 verse, 30, verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Isaiah 57, verse 7 and 8 says this. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And the Apostle Paul says it was promised in Isaiah and it is going to come true. And I'm telling you, in the year 2020, it was promised in Isaiah, it was mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians, and it is going to come true. Not because I am a prophet, but the Bible is trustworthy, and it will come true. we just got to be patient, because God's timing is absolutely perfect. God's timing is absolutely perfect. And then secondly, he goes on to say this. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Hosea 13 verse 14 is where he quotes it from. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh grave, is your destruction? I will have no compassion. And he talks about those who are against him. It is those who come to him in repentance and faith. Where a death is your sting? Where's your plagues? Where's your problems? He goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. What, is it, what does he mean by that? The death, sorry, the sting of, of death is sin. It is through sin that we are judged and there is death. Death now in this life because of Adam's sin, the original sin. See, they would live forever in Eden. But because of their sin, we are living in a sinful state. Although Jesus Christ has come to die for us, redeem us, we still grapple, don't we, every day between right and wrong, good and evil. And we have these two natures at, at war in us. And he says something there. He says, and the power of sin is the law. Why does he say that? Well, if you didn't know that God had said to you, you will have no other gods before me. You will not make for yourself a graven image. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall worship me on the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. If we didn't know those things, would we know what sin is? We'd just be driven by our conscience. And law opens our eyes to understand that God has a standard. And if you don't meet his standard, that's called sin. God has a standard. And God's standard doesn't change. Those are the Ten Commandments. Those which we call the moral law. But right throughout Scripture, we are told again and again and again how we are to live. Put off the old self. Put on the new. Being renewed in the image of Christ. Live a life worthy of being called a follower of Christ. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All these things. And the Bible says that is it. And when we come to Christ, we step outside of the governance of the law and we step into grace. Now don't get me wrong. I'll come back to that in a moment. But law no longer has mastery over us. The grace of Jesus Christ has saved us from sin. But... Human beings, we don't like parameters. 
and we don't like freedom. We think freedom is doing exactly as we please. And freedom is Christ is saying, do what I've called you to do in obedience. So the law is still there for us as Christians, but it is the, the parameters, the outside guidelines of what we have freedom to live inside of. And if we're getting to coveting, stealing, lying, etc., we way, way, way past what we should be doing in our Christian life. If we've got other gods and making graven images and worshipping things instead of the, the true God, we're way, way past where our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ has taken us and the freedom we have. See, that's the difference between law and grace. It's not that law falls away, but that you are free to live in that grace environment in relationship with God but still not break his law. Okay. I think I'm on my soapbox all day today. Our earthly bodies, lastly, must be ready. Our earthly bodies must be ready. What that really means is all that we do here and now is preparing ourselves for heaven. All we are doing here and now is honing our Christian lives as a forerunner for what we'll be like in heaven. In all its frailty and its madness and its brokenness, our aim should be that we're wanting to live now in the light of heaven. Look with, with me, if you will, right there at verse 58. Therefore, the whole of chapter 15 Verse 1 through to verse 57. All about the resurrection, all about everything that God has given us, all about the promises, all about our, our um, heavenly bodies that will be immortal and, and will be modeled by Christ. All of that. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. What does it mean by that? Let nothing distract you and take you away from following the course of Jesus Christ. Let nothing move you. Always um, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. What does that mean? So you've got to give yourself fully to what's going on in the church. So next Sunday at quarter past seven, I expect you all yes so that you can come and no. What's he saying? Where is the Lord working? The Lord is working firstly and foremost where? In you. But when the Lord works in us, what do we do? Our earthly nature wants us to step back. Lord, teach me patience. But let me be angry with so-and-so first and impatient with them and tear a strip off them and then I'll be patient. He says, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. The Lord working in you and the Lord working through you in other people's lives. God is working all the time. And he will work with you and through you if you allow him to. If you don't, you won't hamper God because God is God. He'll work around you. And my prayer is, Lord, never never work around me work through me and in me always give yourself fully to the work of the lord because you know that your labor in the lord is not in vain your labor in the lord is not in vain therefore my dear brothers stand firm let nothing move you I've got this, this picture whenever I uh, you think of standing firm. It was an old Charlie Chaplin movie. I'm sure you've seen it where he's got these long shoes on. And, and uh, I think they were nailed to the floor or something. Because people push him and, goes, and he comes up straight again. You remember that old movie? I, I always got that picture in my mind of no matter what happened to him, he stayed in the same place. He just came in back to an upright position. It's almost like those, those weighted... Um, blah up dolls that they give the kids 
that you punch it and it falls over and comes back up straight again. What a joy that is that we stand, that yes, we might be pushed over, but it will come up right again. Why? Because God is with us. And if everything goes wrong now, 56 years, that's all I've been on this earth. Some of you here have almost double, no, not quite double my age. I think Denise is coming to double my, and no, I'm not <laughs> joking. <laughs> is nothing compared to eternity. Is nothing compared to the joy and the, the, the praise and the honor and the glory that will be ours in heaven. When he says to you, come my child, I've got a place for you. It's called heaven. No more suffering, no more tears, no more anguish. It's yours. Paid for in full by Jesus Christ. John 14, verse 1. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me where I am. That's the promise that we hold on to with everything. Because God's promises are true and faithful. Let's pray. Lord, we saw in that last hymn, you will gather, you'll gather bright jewels for your kingdom, precious jewels, the delight of the Lord. Oh Lord, we thank you that this is a promise that is given to each one of us who trust and believe in you. So Lord, we might know that our future is secure. We don't know what will happen here. That's the mystery. Or when it will happen. But the truth is. One day. You are coming back. Oh Lord Jesus. Just as the Apostle John. In, in the last words in Revelation said. He who testifies to these things says. Yes. I am coming soon. And the reply to that. For each one should be, Amen, Lord, come soon. Oh, Father, we praise you as we have heard and once again been reminded of the resurrection, that it is truly the joy that awaits us because you have prepared a place for each one of us. Oh, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Let's stand as we sing our, our final hymn. And remember, we'll have a retiring collection uh, at the door uh, because we can't pass the bags around. Let's stand as we sing together.
Thank you. Will you be seated for a moment? Before I close this morning, we're starting again with our services. We're hoping that we're going to have more and more folk uh, join us. But with that comes other responsibilities. With that comes... We need to be sitting up on, in the morning, and we normally do that at about quarter to nine to make sure that everybody's, everything's ready for when people arrive. We still need to have counters that will help with a collection on a Sunday morning. So I'm going to ask Gay, she'll be at the table with a clipboard. If you would want to help with, with helping to set up, etc., just let us know. Also, readers, we'll need readers um, for our services. So will you do that before you leave today? Say, I'm willing to to be involved, uh, you can get me up at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning so I can come and... No, I'm joking. <laughs> Quarter to nine is when we normally uh, do sit. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this encouraging message this morning. We wait in expectation for that day. Oh, Lord, speed it on. Come, Lord, come quickly. Oh, Lord, let us see the face of Jesus Christ. So as we leave now, Lord, let us walk in victory. Let us know that this is but temporary because our heavenly bodies will be eternal, immortal in every way. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that one day we'll be transformed to be like your heavenly body. Lord Jesus, we praise you. Your name is wonderful and great. Amen. Amen. Amen.